Friends, welcome to Westminster Seminary in California. Thank you for joining us for our annual conference. For many of you, this is your first time joining us. And for others of you, this is your annual ritual, uh, coming into Escondido, California to join us for our conference every January. Now this year, things look a little bit different as you might have noticed already. Instead of welcoming you to our campus for us to enjoy meeting with you and fellowshipping with you, and we hope that we can return to that format next year, this year we're joining you virtually online in your home on your screens. And we are uh, thankful that you are here with us to hear from our fine speakers this morning. The topic for this year is a topic that's near and dear to us. Westminster Seminary California exists for the churches and the topic of church is always important. This year, we wanna focus on that topic again under the title, The Church in Exile. As many of you know, as God's people, we recognize that we are not yet home. And perhaps you, like me, in, in experiencing and witnessing all that has happened around us, not only in recent weeks, but for the last week, uh, year or so, we recognize that we indeed are not home, and this is not the way it's supposed to be. An exploration of the church, its nature, its identity, its responsibility as we think about the world around us, as well as our own growth and maturation in faith is in order, and we're delighted to bring these lectures to you. There is one more element of change here I wanna share with you, and this is a sad news for our community and our family of Westminster Seminary, California. Many of you look forward to hearing from our former president and professor of history, uh, Dr. Robert Godfrey, who is, was slated to speak for us as our anchor, the last speaker. But you will note that he will not be joining us this weekend, and that's because of a personal tragedy in the family. His daughter uh, passed away and is now in glory. And as a result, he won't be able to speak at this conference. As a family of Westminster, we're praying for the Godfrey family, as well as the family of his daughter, uh, uh, McFay's, and we ask you to join us as we lift them up for the Lord's comfort and his presence to be experienced fully in their lives. In his place, we've asked one of our newest faculty members, Dr. Brad Bittner, to join us and to bring us God's word. And we are delighted to introduce him to you, and I think you will find his lecture and talk to be encouraging and challenging, as all other talks will be. Thank you for joining us again. Do remember us and pray for us as we remember you and pray for you. And may this time be enriching, not only for us personally, but as we think about the Lord's work within our churches and our future responsibilities. Thank you. Good evening and welcome friends to Westminster Seminary California's 2021 annual conference. My name is Ryan Glomsrud. I'm the Academic Dean and Associate Professor of Historical Theology here at the seminary. And it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you on behalf of the faculty and administration to our online conference, The Church in Exile. These conferences are held first and foremost to serve the church by addressing important topics from God's Word. And secondarily, to introduce our faculty and our teaching uh, to a broader, even global community. Although we can't see your face uh, this year, as we do in past years, we know that we are welcoming uh, many first-time visitors, many current and returning students, and many alumni who are eager to uh, reconnect with their alma mater in these COVID and quarantine days. It will be my honor to serve as your host uh, for this conference this year. And in this capacity, I have a number uh, of announcements to make before we begin. First, I direct your attention to the conference program, which is available uh, online. It's also available as a download uh, by, by PDF. It's at uh, wscal.edu uh, backslash conference. Let this pro conference program be your guide. All these sessions will be broadcast at the times listed on the program and are available on this link, which you are currently watching. There will be a short break between uh, each speaker and a countdown clock will immediately uh, begin clicking down, indicating how many minutes you have until the next session begins. 
uh, after the conference, uh, all of the sessions will be available for uh, distribution and viewing and sharing as you wish. Tomorrow, it will be my pleasure to moderate a live Q&A session. That will not be available on this link, but will be accessed uh, through a Zoom room uh, with a different connection, and the information is available, again, on the conference website. We would love to entertain your questions during the Q&A, and there are two ways that you can submit questions. Uh, during the lectures, after the lectures, uh, at any time this evening or tomorrow, uh, please submit your questions uh, by email to conference uh, at wscal.edu, uh, conference .westcal at westcal.edu, uh, and also by Twitter at hashtag WSCCONF. Finally, some of our speakers uh, have included outlines for their uh, lecture uh, addresses, and those are available, again, on the conference website. That concludes my announcements. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening and tomorrow. I think we have a, a wonderful and edifying conference uh, in store. Our first speaker this evening is joining us from Tennessee due to COVID uh, travel restrictions. Nevertheless, it will be a joy to welcome on screen uh, with us Dr. Dennis Johnson, Professor Emeritus of Practical Theology at Westminster Seminary, California where he has taught from 1982 to 2018. He is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church in America, and among his many, many publications are Him We Proclaim, Preaching Christ from All the Scriptures, Triumph of the Lamb, Commentary on the Book of Revelation, and Walking with Jesus Through His Word, Discovering Christ and All the Scriptures. His plenary lecture this evening is entitled, The Church as Exiles. Please welcome Dr. Johnson. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It is my joy to be with you again for Westminster Seminary California's 2021 faculty conference. As you know, our theme is the church in exile, and I've been invited to speak to the church as exiles as we begin our reflection on this important topic. Now, exile is a painful word. It has overtones of being homeless, of not belonging, of being alien and strange, of being socially and legally marginalized, and so lacking rights and being vulnerable to being exploited and to being abused. In the Bible, exile also carries the overtones of banishment, of being cast out of the place we belong, the place we once called home and to which we long to return. Dr. Ian Duguid, Westminster, California's uh, once Old Testament professor who now teaches at Westminster in Philadelphia, has written this, exile in theological terms is the experience of pain and suffering that results from the knowledge that there is a home where one belongs, yet for the present one is unable to return there. This existential sense of deep loss may be compounded by a sense of guilt or remorse stemming from the knowledge that the cause of exile is sin. Now, being in exile actually hurts more than being a pilgrim, which Dr. Horton will be speaking about in our next lecture this evening. Both exiles and pilgrims are not home where they belong, but pilgrims look ahead. They're heading toward a destination. They have a home to come in their sights. Exiles, on the other hand, look back to a safe haven that has been lost. The pain of their no longer at homeness is compounded by the fact that exiles have tasted the sweetness of what they've lost. And what's more, as Dr. Duguid wrote, in biblical history, often the dislocation of exiles is the result of sin and rebellion. Think of Israel's exile, for example. For them, Israel meant expulsion from God's promised land, first through the Assyrian scattering of Israel's northern tribes, and then through the Babylonians' destruction of Jerusalem and carrying so many from Judah into captivity. These disasters were the bitter consequence of their violation of the Lord's covenant as he had forewarned them through Moses. We read in Deuteronomy 28, 
verses 15 and following, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Later on, these are the curses. You shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And among these nations you shall find no respite, and there shall be no resting place for your foot. For the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. And when that curse finally came, the prophet Ezekiel spoke God's word to Judah's exiles in Babylon. We read in Ezekiel 36 verses 17 and following, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. So I, the Lord, scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed among the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But of course, Israel's exile from Canaan was actually a replay of an earlier exile from an even sweeter homeland. That exile, exile happened at the dawn of history, and it affected the whole human race. You see, when Adam and Eve, our first parents, exchanged God's truth for the lie, God expelled them from his garden of delights. John Milton called it right, paradise lost. We read at the end of Genesis 3, the Lord God sent Adam out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So it's fitting to find treasonous Israel in exile. They brought it on themselves by breaking covenant with their Lord and Redeemer. And it makes sense that our first parents were banished from God's God's garden, and we, their rebellious children, are still in exile. Adam brought it on himself and us, and we've compounded the problem by breaking covenant with our Creator and our Lord. But the theme of our conference is the church in exile. The church is the gathering of God's chosen and redeemed people, the Messiah's beloved bride. The church is composed of people who, in spite of ourselves, are embraced by God's grace through the new and unbreakable covenant which is secured by the blood of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. How dare we speak of the church in exile? Well, we speak this way because the New Testament does, and specifically, the Apostle Peter does in his first epistle, which is going to be our really our camping point for this first message. Peter opens his epistle, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And later on, Peter returns to the exile theme. In chapter 1, verse 17, he says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And then in chapter 2, 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Now Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia were provinces of the Roman Empire that covered most of modern-day Turkey. So this letter's original audience were living outside the Promised Land. In the eyes of first-century Jewish people, Therefore, living in this region would be living as exiles in the dispersion. But it was not terrestrial geography that Peter had in mind when he addressed them as exiles of the dispersion. Actually, it was profound theology. Because in fact, Peter's readers were not scattered Jews who, eventually come to, who had eventually come to faith in Jesus. They were Gentiles from non-Israelite ancestry. That's clear from this epistle. Their roots were deep in heathen paganism, idolatry, substance abuse, and sensuality. But when God's Spirit shone gospel light 
into the darkness of their hearts and minds, drawing them to trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, their whole perception of the world, their affections, their behavior, all were suddenly and radically transformed so they no longer fit in the society in which they had been raised. Where do we see this in Peter's letter? Well, listen to how Peter describes their past. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Instead, he calls them to be holy. A few verses later, chapter 1, verse 18, you were ransomed from the futile ways of living inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Their enslavement to idols and sensual pleasure had been inherited from their ancestors in previous generations. It was a way of looking at life and a way of living that was so entrenched, entrenched in the culture that everyone around them, grandparents and parents, siblings and cousins, neighbors, friends, coworkers, everybody considered that this lust-driven life was completely normal, just common sense, the way we do things around here. And Peter's readers had been so entrenched in the decadence of their pagan culture that the life transformation that they experienced when they became Christians made them look very odd and very strange, even alien, to those who had been their friends and were still at home in that old way of life. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, the beginning of the chapter, he says, now live the rest of your life the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time has passed, and it's enough for your doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality and passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they, all the people that you used to participate with in these things, they are surprised. They think it's strange when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. In other words, your former fellows in drunkenness and substance abuse and womanizing are shocked that you don't share their soiled appetites anymore. You look weird to them. They're confused by the change you've undergone, and so they badmouth you. Once upon a time, Peter's first readers fit comfortably into that corrupt lifestyle. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, had come to their rescue. He had ransomed them, set them free from that old way of life. Not only rescued them from the wrath of God, which they richly deserved, but set them free from the control of that old and idolatrous and sensual way of life. And so as a result, these Christians had become strangers in their own hometowns. They were aliens who no longer belonged in the communities in which they'd grown up. Oh, they may be living in the same houses where they were born, but they were actually distant from their true homeland. And it's their true homeland, which is also our true homeland, that makes them and us exiles on this earth. See, right after his opening address, Peter addressed this. He talked to them as chosen exiles of the dispersion, and then he began to talk about our true homeland as he began by blessing God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Peter speaks then of an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. An inheritance imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, your true homeland. And it's their distance, our distance, from that future inheritance, the homeland that God is leading us to, that explains why Peter's first readers no longer fit where they had once been so comfortable they're strange. They're odd. They're not at home in this broken world because their real home, our real home, is out of this world. So
So Peter's readers, future destiny is the deeper theological reason that he calls us exiles, chosen, and belonging to the dispersion. We may live in the communities in which we grew up, rubbing elbows with former cronies in corruption, but we're now different people. And we have a different, as Paul would say in Philippians, a different citizenship in heaven. And that exile alien identity is just as true of us today as it was of Peter's first readers in the first century. We may live in the same community that we did before Christ invaded our lives and rescued us from our past and from ourselves and from God's wrath. We speak the same language and eat the same diet and wear the same clothing as our non-Christian neighbors and friends and relatives and co-workers, but we are still strangers, exiles in the dispersion, scattered away from our future inheritance. So that's our identity. Now we want to ask Peter two questions about that identity that will help us to begin to get into this topic for our conference. First question, how is it that we, of all people, come to inherit such a glorious heavenly homeland? And then the second question that flows from that, since we are heirs of such a wonderful home, how should we exiles interact with the earthly society that is no longer our true home? So those are the, the questions that we're going to be posing to Peter's first letter for the rest of this lecture. How did we come to inherit such a glorious heavenly homeland? After all, since we are children of Adam the rebel, Adam the exile, and have we have followed in our father Adam's rebellion and live in his exile, by nature we deserve to be in exile forever, not to be pilgrims destined to return home to the inheritance that God grants to those he loves, not to return back where we belong in communion with our good creator. We don't deserve that. How can Peter say that people like us have living hope for an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for us? Well, Peter's answer to that question was implied in his very address at the beginning when he addressed us as those who have been chosen for sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ, that's verse 2, and then he stated that our new birth to living hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus Christ died for us and his blood cleanses our conscience of guilt. Jesus Christ rose for us and his resurrection is the source of our living hope. His death and resurrection redefine our identity and our destiny, who we are and where we're going. We could well say actually about the death of Jesus, God's son endured exile in order to bring us home. In fact, Christ's exile from heaven's joys began with his incarnation, and Peter talks about that in chapter 1, verse 20. He says, Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. That's Peter's version of what Paul says in Galatians 4, 4, and 5, when Paul says it this way, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And as we earlier heard, Peter speaks of our being ransomed by Christ's blood from the empty lifestyle inherited from previous pagan generations. But we also need to be ransomed, redeemed from the curse that we deserve before the righteous judgment seat of God. Christ's death redeemed us from sin's curse and sin's control. And that's part of what Peter wants us to see in this letter. In fact, in the second chapter, he echoes in so many ways Isaiah's portrait of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 to show that Christ's suffering is for our healing. Listen to what Isaiah says. These are familiar words, I know, but hear them again so that you can then hear the echo in Peter's description of Jesus. Isaiah 53, starting at verse 4. Surely he, the servant, 
has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That's exile. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. That's Isaiah's portrait many centuries before the coming of Christ. Now listen to the echoes as Peter describes the work of Jesus. Peter says, 1 Peter 2, beginning at verse 21, to this you've been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. Remember, Isaiah had said, he opened not his mouth. He continued trusting and trusting himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you are healed. For you were straying like lost sheep. There's the final echo of Isaiah. But now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. When God the Son left the joys of heaven to experience the miseries of this sin-stained earth, his leaving home was costly. But the depth of his exile was portrayed here in Isaiah and now by Peter. The depth of his exile happened several decades later as he hung on a cross, and it's expressed in his lament that we know so well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That God-forsakenness of the beloved Son is the ultimate anguish of exile. He was stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted not for his sins. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. That's what Isaiah says. That's what Peter says. Not for his sins, but for our sins. And the purpose of his exile under the curse of sin for us is our homecoming. In the next chapter, Peter says, chapter 3, verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, that he might bring us home to the Father where we belong. So Christ's exile from the Father's favor for us and his resurrection to life for us are that complex of events that transform our exile into pilgrimage. He's transformed our no longer at home into our not yet at home, not to steal too much of Dr. Horton's thunder there. We no longer simply look back and lament paradise lost, the home we forfeited by Adams and our rebellion, we also look forward to paradise regained, the even better home that Christ, our champion, has opened for us and to which he's leading us. That's why we can be heirs of this heavenly homeland. And so we're called to follow in the footsteps of the suffering servant who walked a path of suffering to glory. Peter tells us that the spirit of Christ, speaking through the ancient prophets, were foretelling the sufferings of the Christ, and the glories that would follow, 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. And Peter says the same path is laid out for us as exiles through suffering now, brief suffering, to ultimate, eternal, endless glory. He makes the point early in the letter and then again later on. Early, it's in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, even though it's tested by fire, 
so that your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then toward the end of the letter, chapter 5, verse 10, Peter says, After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The same path for Jesus as for us, suffering and then glory. The same path for us as for Jesus, suffering and then glory. Now, Peter draws a very significant contrast between Christ's suffering and the trials that his own readers were enduring, at least at the moment when he wrote. There are many contrasts, but I want to point out one of them to you right here. Uh, not the most important, because Christ's suffering was sacrificial and atoning for us. Our suffering is not that. But it is interesting that when Peter gets specific about Jesus' sufferings, he catalogs both verbal and physical assaults. He talks about Christ being insulted, about wounds, about bloodshed, about the tree. But when Peter gets specific about the Christians' suffering in the Roman provinces of Asia Minor at the moment when he's writing, all he talks about is verbal abuse. No arrests mentioned, no imprisonment, no loss of home or property, no beating or flogging, no being burned at the stake to light the emperor's garden parties, no bloody martyrdom in the arena. Instead, Peter uses simply five terms to describe how unbelievers badmouth Christians. He uses the term slander in 2.12 and 3.16. Also in 3.16, he uses another word, revile. And then in 2.23, he speaks of Christ being cursed by people and implies that we too may experience that. In 4.4, he says that those who don't understand you, who think you're strange, malign you. The word that also refers to blasphemy, uh, another word for slander. And then finally, he talks about being insulted for the name of Christ in 4.14. So when Peter wrote at that moment, his original readers were facing the same kinds of uncomfortable verbal abuse that American Christians sometimes experience today. Insults, slander, makes us feel unfairly treated, sometimes so angry and resentful that we're tempted to retaliate with insults back. Now, things would get worse, as we know. In fact, toward the end of Nero's reign, the hostility of the surrounding society would escalate to violence and torture and bloodshed. And that will continue for the next several centuries of the Roman Empire. And it still continues in many places in the world today. But the brothers and sisters who first heard Peter's words read in the congregations throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia were experiencing simply an assault of words, the same kind of thing that we experience today. And yet, even though Jesus' sufferings were unimaginably more severe than ours, more redemptively, infinitely more redemptively powerful than ours, still Jesus is our trailblazer. And not only in walking the suffering to glory path that he walked, but also in the way that he walked that path as an exile in the world. His patient trust in the Father and his patient kindness toward his attackers. That sets the pace for us as well. So that brings us actually to the second question that we want Peter to answer for us, and that is, how should we exiles interact with the society that is no longer our home? Peter gives us five prohibitions and four commands. Five negative statements. Do not be surprised. Do not be ashamed, do not be afraid, do not be defiant, and do not be conformed. And for positive commands, be hopeful, be holy, be reliable, be loving. Let's look at those in some depth and how Peter develops these. First, the prohibitions. Do not be surprised. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, beloved, do not be surprised. Do not think it strange at the fiery trial 
as it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter knows that trouble that hits you from behind when you're not looking hurts worse than an attack you can see coming and brace yourself for. Peter the fisherman knew that when we expect smooth sailing, the sudden onset of a storm shocks us and catches us off guard. But if we see storm clouds looming on the horizon, then we have time to batten the hatches before the winds and the waves crash and we're less likely to be capsized. And so Peter says, face it, you don't belong here. Don't be shocked. Don't be caught off guard when people treat you as if you don't belong, when people treat you like an alien who can be kicked around and mocked. After all, you are an alien. Now, in those early centuries, when Christians were obviously out of power in the Roman Empire, as Peter's readers were, maybe it wasn't so hard to be not surprised not caught off guard by opposition and unfair treatment and slander and contempt and worse. Still, Peter tells them they shouldn't be surprised, but maybe it made sense. Things changed in the early fourth century. The emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And from then on, it became harder, I think, for the church to maintain the exile mindset that the New Testament teaches us, to not be shocked by hostility from the surrounding culture. From Constantine on, the church had the reins of power in the empire, later in Western Europe, and then across to North America and elsewhere. And I think even today, Western Christians, including many, many Americans, have gotten comfortable with the assumption that our culture is basically molded by biblical ethical standards. And so we're surprised when those standards are violated. Remember, though, that even as far back as the birth of the American Republic, influential voices like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin doubted the very central truths of our faith. But certainly in the late 20th century and now in the first two decades of the 21st century, American Christians increasingly feel like exiles and aliens in the land of our birth. In reaction to the relentless drift toward new versions of old paganism, suddenly Christians are shocked to discover that the cultural consensus that once made us feel so at home has disappeared. The ground has shifted under our feet, so followers of Jesus are waking up to find that we are aliens on the outside looking in. We're shocked. We're surprised. Peter says you shouldn't be. Don't be surprised. And don't be ashamed. Peter goes on in chapter 4. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, Peter's using tabernacle and temple imagery here. He says, just as the cloud of God's glory rested on the tabernacle in the wilderness, so the spirit of glory and of God rests on you when you are criticized and opposed for your faith. And just as God announced through later prophets, Ezekiel and Malachi, that he would come first to his house, to his temple, to purify his worshipers. So now the suffering that you're experiencing are his refining fire to purify your faith, which is more precious than the finest gold. So Peter says, you have no reason to be ashamed of bearing the name of Christ. You have no reason to be ashamed when others badmouth you for Jesus' sake. Their insults are not symptoms of your Lord's absence as though he's he's forgotten you. They're seals of his presence with you, as clear and bright as the fiery cloud that illuminated Israel's camp in the wilderness. Don't be ashamed. And don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Back in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Peter says, Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. 
have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Those who treasure Christ the Lord above all discover that ultimately no one can destroy them. And that's because nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. No fear. Now, the more we are fixated on the threats that abound in this land of our exile, the more our hearts are going to be enslaved by fear. But the more we exalt Christ as Lord, hold him as holy, Christ who faced the world's worst for us and emerged triumphant in resurrection life, the more we focus on exalting him in our hearts, the more we will be set free from fear of what people can do to us. Don't be afraid. Don't be surprised. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. But also, don't, do not be defiant. You see, Christ-shaped fearlessness is very different from aggressive defiance. Courage can be carried to an ugly, evil extreme, a combative arrogance toward those who do not share our faith, and Christ's apostle will not let us go there. Instead, as we just heard, he enjoins fearlessness blended with gentleness, with humility, with respect as people interrogate us for the hope that is within us. In fact, he calls all of us who are exiles in this foreign territory to respect offices of authority ordained by God even when the evil conduct of those in those offices does not deserve respect. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 13 and following. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter says, I know foolish people are accusing Christians of undermining society, defying the government. Don't give them ammunition. In fact, more than that, let your good conduct expose and silence their slander. And do this as you honor everyone, including the Emperor Nero, who was on the throne in Rome, as Peter wrote. Not apparently toward the end of Nero's reign, but nevertheless, he was ruling Ro the Roman world when Peter wrote. America's political rancor over the last few years, and particularly over last year's presidential election, has tempted many followers of Jesus to treat our leaders with anything but honor. Insult, mockery, defiance, contempt, you name it. We followed the world's lead in throwing mud and worse than mud from the safe distance of the internet, over Twitter, Facebook, whatever social media outlet we choose, what if we were to take seriously our calling to follow the footsteps of the suffering servant who did not retaliate to insults with insults? What if we put right over our computer screen so that we see it, this verse from 1 Peter 2, every time we sit down at our keyboards to set the world straight, what if we read first, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the authorities? How would that make a difference in the way we communicate on the internet? Interestingly, Peter uses the same word fear that he's used to say, don't fear them, to encourage us to show a healthy kind of fear, not terror, but respect and honor. He says that to slaves. Uh, in chapter 2, verses 18 and following, be subject to your masters with all respect. It's the same term, fear. 
Even if your masters are crooked or unfair and don't deserve your respect, still honor them, respect them, fear them in a healthy way. He says it to wives whose husbands are not believers. He says your husband should be able to see your respectful, that's the word fear in there, conduct, and so be drawn to faith in Jesus. And as we heard in chapter 3, Peter insists that Christians who are undergoing interrogation for our faith, for our hope, must offer our defense of our faith with gentleness and respect. Do not be defiant. But finally, do not be conformed. The last prohibition, do not be conformed. Peter says, 1 Peter 1.14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Last month in an article in The Spectator, Ben Sixsmith, an English social commentator who lives in Poland, noted the title of his article, The Sad Irony of Celebrity Pastors. He was commenting on one of the latest sex scandals involving a high-profile church leader. Sixsmith wrote this. He said, I'm not religious, so it's not my place to dictate to Christians what they should and should not believe. Still, if someone has a faith worth following, I feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there's nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. Although our unbelieving neighbors and co-workers who are still at home in the world in which we are now strange aliens may badmouth us, they are watching us. And actually, they're looking for something different in us. In fact, twice Peter uses a term that use, appears nowhere else in the New Testament. The ESV translates it C, but it's, that's a very weak translation. The lexicons refer more to watching, observing, not just a glance, but a firm, fixed stare. Chapter 2, 1 Peter 2.12, Peter says to all of us, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may observe, they may watch your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. He's obviously thinking of the day of Christ's return, when what they've seen in Christians is so different from what's going on in the world, that they are compelled to acknowledge the, Jesus, the difference that Jesus has made in us. In the other use of the term, Peter actually suggests that what non-Christians observe in the followers of Christ may bear beautiful fruit in the present, not just at the return of Christ. Peter says to wives who are married to non-Christian husbands, uh, continue to honor your husbands, be submissive to them, uh, that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives as they watch, as they observe, your respectful and pure conduct. Chosen exiles, the watching world expects you to be strange in a good way. Don't disappoint your audience. Give them something different to observe. Don't be conformed. Well, four positive exhortations. Be hopeful, lift your eyes from the present mess and threats and focus on the future glory. That's the positive side of don't be afraid or ashamed. Peter has spoken of our living hope as we heard at the very beginning. He says in 1.13, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says in 1.21, your faith and hope must be in God. We long to look into the future especially when the present makes it so obvious that the future cannot be seen by us and it may be threatening. Jesus warned us not to fret over the immediate future, which we can't do much about anyway, not even tomorrow's troubles. Peter agrees with his Lord, but he says, look at the distant future. Fix your sights further on the hope, on the salvation to be brought to you. Feed and nourish your hope and that your exile status now really whets your appetite for what is to come. Be holy. 
positively. Your pure behavior looks strange to outsiders, but it fits you because your father says, be holy as I am holy, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. And then later on in verse 22, same chapter, he says, you've purified your souls by obeying the truth, that is by trusting in the gospel. So now live with brotherly love. We'll come to that in just a moment. That's the point that Ben Sixsmith was making in that Spectator article. As a non-believer, he wants Jesus' followers to look strange, to look holy in an attractive way. And so does our Father, who says to us, be holy, for I am holy. Be reliable. Demonstrate conscientious integrity, even toward unfair and unreasonable people. This is the positive side of don't be defiant. Even if exiles in a strange land don't, may not react to the cultural pressures around us by conforming or by retaliating, we might still be tempted to a sort of passive aggressive resistance, doing slipshod work with half-hearted efforts, since life is not fair and the power brokers are cruel. But Christ expects a positive, conscientious faithfulness. He says it's God's will that by doing good, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Chapter 2, verse 15. To slaves, just a few verses later, he says it's a gracious thing when you do good and you're punished for it, suffering unjustly. That is a gracious thing in the sight of God. In the third chapter, 16 and 17, he says, maintain a good conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior will be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, for doing God's will. Be holy and be reliable. Peter, Paul directed slaves in Titus 2.10 to make the gospel look good, to adorn the gospel by their respectful attitudes and their conscientious labor by reliable integrity, by generous neighborliness, even when corrupt people mistreat us as exiles and aliens. Finally, be loving, strenuously committed to each other. Peter makes this point twice as well. This is really what it means to be the church in exile. We're not solo explorers or solitary drifters. We are and must behave as a band of pilgrims. Peter says in 122, now that you've purified your souls by trusting in the gospel for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from the heart. And again in chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, keep loving each other earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins and show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Love one another strenuously. How do we treat one another, brothers and sisters? The politics and the pandemic of 2020 brought a lot of ugliness, not only in the way Christians talk about public leaders, but also in the way we talk to and about one another. Obviously, we have sincere differences of opinion about how serious COVID-19 is and how to respond to it. Obviously, in the bitterness of the recent national election, we have sincere differences of perspective on the 45th present president and on the 46th president, I expect to be inaugurated next Tuesday. How should followers of Jesus speak to and about each other when our perspectives differ sharply on issues like these, which dominate discussion and fuel fury in the wider context of our culture? Peter says, 1 Peter 2.1, put away malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. When you face your brothers and sisters in Christ, put down your weapons. Love one another strenuously. Wow, that's hard. Our calling as exiles is uncomfortable. We're not called to be isolated from, nor to be absorbed into the society around us. We're called to be engaged but not conformed, like Daniel and Mordecai and ancient faithful Jews exiled in Babylon and Persia. Toward the end of the second century, the epistle to Diognetus was written to persuade others to follow Jesus, or at least to persuade the powers that be that Christians were not a seditious movement, movement intent on overthrowing society. The author, whose name we do not know, described Christians in this way. Christians
are not distinguished from the rest of mankind, either in locality or speech or customs. They dwell not in cities of their own, neither do some, they use some different language or practice an extraordinary kind of life. While they dwell in the cities of the Greeks and the barbarians as the lot of each is cast, and they follow the native customs in dress and food and other arrangements of life, yet the constitution of their own citizenship contradicts expectation. They dwell in their own countries, but as sojourners. They bear the responsibilities in all things as citizens, but they endure hardships as strangers. Every foreign country is a fatherland to them, and every fatherland is foreign. They marry like all other men and beget children, but they do not expose their children to the elements. They have their meals in common, but not their wives. Their existence is on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Wouldn't it be a gracious thing, as Peter says, if Jesus' followers in the 21st century could be described the way our second century brothers and sisters were described? Wouldn't it be a credit to our Redeemer if the world watching the church's life as exiles sees us following in the footsteps of the servant who suffered for us, though he himself was innocent, who did not repay insult with insult? By his wounds we are healed, and we straying sheep are retrieved by our good shepherd who brings us home to God, our Father. Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you for joining us this evening for the first plenary session with Dr. Johnson. We hope that you stay online and enjoy the rest of the conference with us and that it will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. If you'd like to partner with Westminster Seminary California in preparing men and women to serve Christ, his gospel, and his church, please prayerfully consider a gift to the seminary by visiting us at westcal.edu. The donate tab is in the upper right-hand corner of the page.
Our next speaker this evening is a man who needs a little introduction. Dr. Michael Horton is J. Gresham Machen, Professor of Systematic Theology and Apologetics, and has taught at Westminster Seminary, California since 1998. He is an ordained minister in the United Reformed Churches in North America, the longtime president of the White Horse Inn and editor-in-chief of Modern Reformation Magazine, as well as the author of more than 20 books. His most recent publications include Rediscovering the Holy Spirit, God's Perfecting Presence in Creation, Redemption, and Everyday Life, a two-volume book on the doctrine of justification, and a book called Ordinary, Sustainable Faith in a Radical, Restless World. He will speak this evening on the theme, The Church as Pilgrims. Please welcome Dr. Horton. Well, the odd circumstances of this conference itself and the last year that we have endured underscores even more than ever that we're pilgrims in this age. And I want to focus our attention in this conference at this point on what it means for us to think of ourselves as pilgrims. You know, I uh, tell students at the beginning of the, uh, the first theology class that there are basically three categories uh, I think of when, I, when I'm, uh, I imagine how people view themselves in the world. The first is a master. You know, we're in charge, we're in control, we've arrived. If we can only get people to agree with us, if we can only get people into our party, our, our group, our circle, if we can only remake things according to our picture of things, then everything would be fine because we get it, we understand it, we've arrived. We just need everybody else to arrive with us. That's the master. And, and for many centuries in the modern world, that has kind of governed our way of being in the world. We think of ourselves as large and in charge. The second category, I tell the students, is tourists. You know, we, we kind of in reaction against that sense that we have all the answers, we say, well, we, we really don't know anything as long as that works for you, as long as you're happy. I have my story, you have your story. And everything is equally interesting when it comes to religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, Wicca. They're all kind of interesting. I dabble in a little bit of this, a little bit of that, sort of like just staying on a permanent cruise. And then the third category, which is the hardest category for people to live in, is that of pilgrims. It's easy to be a master, it's an illusion, but it's easy to be a master, to think of yourself and the people around you as the ones who really get it. it you know, when you say Jesus is Lord, it really matters how you're saying that. Are you saying that within the framework of being a master? In other words, when you say Jesus is Lord while cleaving the skull of an infidel in the Crusades or by storming the capital with signs of Jesus is Lord, what does that actually mean? Is that what the Bible means when it says that Jesus is Lord? Or a tourist, how does a tourist say Jesus is Lord? Well, they actually don't. They say Jesus is a Lord, maybe, like the Lord Buddha and all kinds of other lords. But the believer has to live in that in-between time in which Jesus Christ is Lord, and yet we don't see the consummation of His kingdom all around us. And there are many passages, uh, as I was thinking about this topic, many passages we could focus on, but I actually thought the Great Commission is a lodestar for understanding where we are right now. You know how it is at the mall, uh, you, well, okay, maybe I'm just unique here, I get lost uh, pretty much in my own house. So I, the first thing I do when I walk into a mall is walk up to the, the marquee that says, you are here. I need to know where I am. Uh, you are here in relation to the things around it. And in this talk, I, I wanna, this is basically a you are here talk. This is where we are not in space so much as in time. We often think the Great Commission starts with go, because we're Americans, we like to go, just get her done, just do it. But it actually begins with a wonderful promise 
All imperatives are nested within grand indicatives, statements about what God has done. Before we go and do something, we have to know why it will even have any hopes of success. And Jesus tells us why when he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore into all nations, making disciples of all peoples, uh, baptizing them in the, uh, uh, preaching the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. I don't think it's pressing too much to see in that very compact formula of the Great Commission the bookends of history within which we live right now. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. He's at the Father's right hand. He's been raised. He's ascended. But now is the time when we go into all nations preaching the gospel, baptizing, and teaching them to observe everything that He's commanded. The mission will be accomplished. In the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, uh, Jesus said that there will be times of great tribulation, and he speaks of it as if it's a pretty long period of time. There'll be earthquakes, there'll be, there will be persecutions, there will be uh, diseases and plagues, but the end is not yet. You know, we, can't, we can't read tea leaves. We can't figure out when some great thing that happens in the daily news is going to be a harbinger of the end times. Jesus says these things will ebb and flow, but the gospel will be preached to all nations. It's a strange kind of promise, right? Because he's saying you'll be persecuted, but the gospel will flourish around the world. And so there will be success for the kingdom of Christ and ultimately for us as we go to our glory proclaiming the gospel of Christ in good times and in bad times, and yet... It will be a time of trouble, the whole period. The last days are the days in which all believers have been living in since the ascension of our Lord. But He will be with us even to the end of the age. The mission will be accomplished, and then the end will come, Jesus says. He will return at the end of the age, gather His elect from the four corners of the earth, judge all, and make all new. So that's, that's the big map. But in order to understand where we are and why this map is important, we have to go back to the Exodus conquest pattern of the Old Testament. The two events that loomed largest in Israel's history were the Exodus and the conquest with Sinai in between, a desert in between Egypt and the land of Canaan. So if we start with Matthew's gospel, it's like walking into a movie in the middle. We have to understand a little bit about how this exodus and conquest in the New Testament related by Matthew is the fulfillment of the trailer for the movie, if you will, in the old. The Song of Moses recounts in Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and His army He has hurled into the sea. Moses prefigured Christ in many ways, but the typology, the foreshadowing, the trailer is never as good as the movie. It's not, it's not the, the main event itself. It's pointing to the coming of the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Like Jesus, the great prophet barely escapes a king's furious massacre, was endowed by the Holy Spirit for his ministry, and was Israel's mediator in the covenantal relationship between God and his people. Like Moses, Jesus stood on a mountain to give his constitution for the new covenant people of God. But Jesus breaks the mold. He transcends all of these types and shadows. His covenant and His mediatorial office 
are greater than that of Moses. Moses was a great servant. God gave his law through him. However, says the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 3 of the epistle to the Hebrews, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are His house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. While the Red Sea was a preview, Christ's cross was the ultimate judgment itself, and He allowed Himself to be drowned, as it were, in that watery judgment in order to be raised for our justification. Like Moses and the Israelites, Jesus was tested in the wilderness. But He undid Israel's sin, just as He undid Adam's sin. He, at every point where Adam and Israel demanded the food they craved, Jesus says, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And all of Jesus' replies to Satan in that temptation are taken from Moses' speech in Deuteronomy 6 and 8. The other major events in Israel's history and consciousness was the conquest as Joshua now led the chosen people into their inheritance and at God's direction drove out the pagan nations before him. One of the things you see in the book of Joshua that's so striking is, and God did it, and God did it, and God did it. God drove them out. The people were were as Psalm 68 recount uh, as Psalm 68 recounts the people were the mighty men were sleeping while the women were dividing the spoils God was at work God was doing all of this and the book of Joshua recounts in narrative form everything that God accomplished until the point at the end where through Joshua God tells the people I I gave you everything not one of my promises has failed I delivered this land and these peoples into your hand. God did it all. And the goal was eating and drinking in the presence of God. You know, that's what Moses did on the mountain, right, with the elders, eating and drinking with God. And, and so much of the book of, of Exodus points us to eating and drinking with God in a new Eden, a land flowing with milk and honey. Similarly, Jesus contrasted His ministry with John the Baptist's ministry, saying, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. It's festive. As the groom attending his wedding reception with the strangers and outcasts dressed in wedding garments as his bride. But between the exodus and the conquest lay a vast desert. And that's where Sinai happens. That's where, that's where basically the wedding happens occurs, the wedding out in the middle of the desert between Yahweh and His people. Even then, God pitched His tent outside the camp. And eventually, when the temple was also constructed as a more permanent residence, God commanded it to be built with three major areas or courts, the outer court of the Gentiles, the inner court of the Jews, and then the most holy place where the high priest entered once a year to offer the atoning sacrifice on the horns of the altar above the Ark of the Covenant containing the tablets of the law. Under Joshua, a new generation of Israelites entered the promised land, driving out the idolatrous and violent nations against whom the Lord had been storing up His wrath. They were squatters in His land. They were polluters and corruptors. Yet even in the land, Israel lost the point of the story and became, became seduced by that very serpent that they were to cast out of God's garden. Instead of allowing the types and shadows of the law to lead them to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they turned to the idols of the nations that they had failed to drive out of God's land. 
for the end of the exile, nothing less is required than a faithful Adam, a true Israel, a true son, who will do all that his father commands. Another contrast with Moses, Moses is standing there at the, uh, at the Red Sea. Remember, he, 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 whenever he held up his hands, the waters parted and the people came through on dry land. His arms got tired. And his officials had to come and prop up his hands, hold up his hands. But our Savior doesn't have to have his hands propped up. He has entered the most holy place. He has taken his seat at the Father's right hand. He is sitting in triumphant session at the Father's right hand, not needing anyone to hold up his arms as he intercedes for us. And so in Christ, we have a new exodus, and that's largely what the book of Acts recounts, right? It's not really the Acts of the Apostles. It's the continuing Acts of Christ after He ascended and sent His Holy Spirit. It's a record of what happened when Jesus took His place at the Father's right hand. It's a new exodus. Jesus was raised after His suffering. There's no exodus without Passover. And instituting the Last Supper to replace Passover on the night in which He was betrayed, With the ambient noise of bleeding Passover sheep, Jesus said, I give you my body and blood. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sins. It's the last will and testament that will go into effect the moment Jesus breathes His last. Therefore, says the writer to the Hebrews, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Not just a temporal inheritance of a temporal land, but Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. Not a sliver of real estate in the Middle East, but the whole earth. And not just for a time, if they obey, as long as they obey in the land, but because of our obedient mediator forever, we inherit the earth. What a wonderful hope that we have. The new exodus is not not looking for something yet to be fulfilled. Christ passed through the waters for us so that we can pass through dry land. Not only crucified, Jesus was raised. And this resurrection, says Luke, was attested by many convincing proofs. But then there was a new wilderness, you know, 40 days of preparation before Jesus ascended in conquest to His throne. Jesus fulfilled Israel's trial during His earthly ministry, but even after His resurrection, He remained in the wilderness with His people, with His disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God, Acts 1-3. That was the subject of the conversation. It was like a Berlitz seminary course these 40 days, where Jesus was teaching them all about the kingdom, preparing them for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, to make them witnesses to what they have heard from Jesus Himself. That's the basis for the New Testament. Jesus promised in the upper room discourse that He would send the Holy Spirit and He would would remind them of everything that He said and taught, including in these 40 days between His crucifixion and ascension. During these 40 days, meals eating and drinking with God are are quite central. Uh, In Acts 1, 4, and 5, Luke reports, and while eating with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In Luke 24, 36 to 43, 
The eating and drinking is especially stressed as a motif. First, as an occasion for Jesus to prove that he isn't a ghost. Do ghosts go around having dinner? Does a ghost have flesh and bones as you see that I have? Peter reports later in Acts, God caused Jesus to be seen not by everyone, but by witnesses who were appointed beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And now we get to eat and drink with Jesus, don't we, in the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, it is bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? This cup that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? And so even though Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father, he's still Joshua. He, he has conquered, and now he has taken his seat at the Father's right hand. And in this, this time of spiritual conquest, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on us. And through his word, and through baptism, and through the Lord's Supper, and through the shepherding ministry of pastors and elders and deacons, he carries his pilgrims to the celestial city. Luke continues his post-resurrection narrative by reporting that Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Hey, look, you know, I've taught you a lot. You've witnessed my ascension, but don't talk to reporters. Go sit in the upper room. You're not ready to be witnesses yet, not until the Holy Spirit is poured out. You see, God doesn't just work with His Word. He works by His Spirit through the Word. We need the Holy Spirit present with us here, and we need our mediator present at the right hand of the Father. You are here. This is where we are right now. We're, Jesus is exactly where we need Him. And the Holy Spirit is exactly where we need Him, leading the campaign on the ground, not only working in front of us, not only working behind us, not only working alongside us, and not even only working above us, but working within us to make us living stones in His temple. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. I have conquered this land. I have done it all for you. A lot of times when we think all, you know, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, well, yeah, he's God. And of course that's true. He always, never for a moment did he not have authority over heaven and earth as the second person of the Trinity. But that's not, that's not what Jesus is telling them in the Great Commission. Jesus is specifically referring to something that has just now happened. All authority in heaven and earth because of my, my obedience and my crucifixion and my resurrection, all authority in heaven and earth has now been given to me. Paul expresses it this way in Philippians 2, 8 through 11, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, therefore, for that reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. Same clause from the Great Commission. And, he adds, under the earth, the living and the dead. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so now we're in the era of the new conquest. Jesus, our forerunner, has already gone before us. Jesus is the one in the book of Joshua, in Joshua 5, where, you remember this great scene where uh, the commander of the Lord's army shows up? Joshua is bloodstained. Uh, the, the, the generation after the faithless generation now entering into the land has just been circumcised. I mean, there's a lot of wailing and crying and blood all over the place. And, and Joshua 
He's probably exhausted. And right then, he comes face to face with this person who calls himself the commander of the Lord's army, and his sword is drawn. All these swords drawn to circumcise, and here he is drawing his sword, uh, looks like against Joshua. Joshua says, whose side are you on, ours or theirs? And he says, neither, for I am the commander of the Lord's army, and now I have come. And from that point on, you have victory after victory, triumph after triumph. It's not, it's not that Joshua, it is a greater Joshua to come, the commander of the Lord's army in flesh who leads this new conquest. Just as Pentecost came 50 days after Pentecost in the Jewish calendar, the new Pentecost, the real Pentecost, comes 50 days after the Passover's uh, sacrifice, the lamb sacrifice on the cross. In the upper room, Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit, and now the Holy Spirit had been poured out. What could be better than Jesus being on the ground leading the campaign like Joshua in the Old Testament? How can it be better that, that the greater Joshua is not here cleaning everything up, making the news? The Old Testament Joshua was around. That's what the disciples are asking in the upper room. What do you mean you keep talking about going, talk, keep talking about leaving? And he says, you don't realize it now, but you will later. It is absolutely essential that I go, for if I do not go, then the Comforter cannot come. You see, Jesus is not the one who regenerates. The Holy Spirit is. We could hear His Word countless times, and our hearts would remain cold to it, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. For this conquest, nothing less than the presence of the Holy Spirit leading the ground campaign is necessary. And now the disciples ask their last question before Jesus ascends, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> They're still thinking of an earthly kingdom. They're thinking about being masters, not pilgrims. We're going to go to Jerusalem and, you know, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That is where our guy, our candidate, is going to be enthroned and inaugurated. And then, you know, remember, James and John have a mom who says, hey, uh, Jesus, um, is, it a, is it possible for my two sons to sit one on your right and one on your left when you come in your glory? When you sit in that throne and you're the king of Israel, right here, right now, can James and John sit on either side of you, and he says, ma'am, you have absolutely no idea what you're asking. You're asking them to be crucified on either side of me, for that is why I've come. Throughout Jesus' ministry, they misunderstood this new exodus and this new conquest. In his transfiguration, Jesus said that I've got to go to Jerusalem for my exodus, and they kept telling Jesus, ah, stop talking, all this negative talk about being crucified. Why do you keep talking about this? Peter took him away three times and said, Jesus, you got to, this is, your, your campaign here is really losing steam because you keep talking about this crucifixion thing. No, we're going to be installed, a new government. Jesus answered the disciples' last question. Now, earthly conquest, by saying it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, at first, it sounds like Jesus isn't answering their question, right? He changes the subject. But it is the answer to his question. And I think sometimes we think it's not the answer to his question because we're like the disciples. You know, we think, yeah, oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, let's, let's talk about end times eschatology and Israel and the Middle East and so on. And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't get it. This conquest is spiritual. It is the Holy Spirit coming through the Word. 
the gospel reaching the ends of the nations. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly what's happening. Even when our brothers and sisters under the cross are sometimes beheaded, lose their jobs. I've met some of these people. It's heartbreaking. When they're baptized, they often seal either their death or intense suffering. A break from their families who will never talk to them again, even sometimes spouses. And yet the gospel goes to the ends of the nations. They know where the lasting treasures are that none but Zion's children know. Yes, the temple will be restored, Jesus says, not in the way that you're imagining. That little, that little copy over there, that's like a, an architect's uh, uh, copy of the, the building he's going to make. That little thing over there, why on earth would I build another copy? Would I restore that copy? No, I'm going to... If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you'd throw that into the ocean. No, I'm building the great end-time temple made without hands, made by the Holy Spirit and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so, brothers and sisters, listen to that. We are conquerors and exiles. <laughs> it's a very weird place to be. We're part of the the conquest of Christ in the present time. We're part of His kingdom. And at the same time, we are aliens, not of the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants, as Paul tells us, but we are aliens in this passing evil age. Yes, citizens, yes, called to pray for the emperors and, and to pay our taxes, and to be good citizens, to fulfill the office of our citizenship in whatever political constitution we're under. But our ultimate citizenship is in heaven, and that makes us aliens and exiles. Not aliens and exiles in relation to God and His holy land, but aliens and exiles in relation to this temporal land. And that's why I think we shouldn't think about the present, where we are, you are here. We shouldn't think about the present as a sort of exile. I think sometimes I hear that uh, it's easy to go back to, to Jeremiah's prophecy uh, or Jeremiah's uh, 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 in, uh, exhortation to the people in exile uh, and say, that. well, that's our exhortation, that should be for us. We're, well, we're actually not living in the period of the exile. We are living in the period of the conquest because our forerunner has gone before us. He has secured victory. He has secured the promised land. I, I go to prepare a place for you. I, I'm making your bed. I'm building your dwelling place. I'm getting it all ready for you. The greater promised land. There are all sorts of ways of downplaying the ascension of Christ. We could say, oh, well, you know, He's not really gone. Uh, he's with us according to His divinity, and that's enough. Or we can say, well, He's not really gone because there's the church. Well, I don't know about you, but for me, I love, I love the church, but I'm, I'm really glad that the church is not a substitute for Christ. There is no vicar of Christ on earth. Our Savior is at the right hand of the Father, and we can't forget the fact that nothing compensates, nothing compensates, not even the presence of the Holy Spirit, who aches within us, causes us to ache for Christ's bodily return. Nothing substitutes for Jesus, commander of the Lord's army, to be present on earth but we don't want him to return in judgment until he has fulfilled his mission 
of salvation. In the meantime, to conclude, in the meantime, Jesus opens up a fissure in history. When he goes up, it's like he burns a hole in the clouds. He burns a hole in history for the Spirit to descend. And now the powers of the age to come are actually breaking in on this present evil age. And that's what makes it so, so weird for us. Uh, one of the most fascinating places I've been is Manaus, in the northern part of Brazil, uh, where, where two rivers that are part of the Amazon meet. And, and one is completely black, and one is like Caribbean water almost. And you can see where these two rivers meet. And you can imagine, because it's the Amazon, it has its own ecosystem. Where those two rivers meet, it has its own ecosystem. You have, you have very different uh, uh, water animals living <laughs> at that intersection between those two streams. That's an analogy for where God has placed us. Where are we now? We're, we're at the intersection of those two streams. Where they're clashing, they're meeting. That's why it's hard to be a pilgrim because we haven't arrived. A pilgrim is someone who knows we haven't arrived. But he's not a tourist. He knows where he's going. He has a place. He has his eyes fixed on a homeland. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus says in Luke 12, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, about your body, what you'll put on. Your, anxious, your anxiety can't add one more day to your life. Jesus doesn't tell them they don't have to work anymore, but he says... Don't be anxious anymore. We're very anxious right now. We're very fearful. Because we think we have to build a kingdom here on earth. But Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not. We need to hear that right now more than ever. Fear not. And fear not, little flock. He doesn't fear not because you're so big, you're so great, you're so amazing. That's what he told Israel not to say when they entered the land, but they did anyway. Not because we have power, not because we know big people, not because we have influence, not because we have cultural clout. Fear not, little flock. We have to accept that we're a little flock. We will be a little flock until Jesus returns. But a little flock spread out all over the world. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He has made us a kingdom of priests. We are the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is growing because of Christ's session at the right hand of the Father and the Spirit's powerful work through His Word. It has been given, it is being given, and when Christ returns, it will be finally consummated. The success of the greater conquest has been guaranteed by the greater Joshua. Our commander has secured the victory. And when we are done, all that is left is to distribute the spoils of that victory to the tribes, to all, all of the believers, all who love his appearing. I've said these things to you, Jesus says, John 16, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's what pilgrims need to hear. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You that You have sent Your Son into the world not to begin redemption, not to be a paradigm of what it means for us to build a kingdom, reconciling people to you, to be a part of his, his mission of saving the world. But you sent him into the world 
to be the Savior, to be the Redeemer, to be the Reconciler. And now, having accomplished everything, having purchased the land for us, having purchased us for the land, has entered in conquest at your right hand and rules and reigns so that the gospel goes forth and one day when he returns, we look forward to all things being made new, to all wrongs being righted, to that great and wonderful day when there will be peace, universal love, universal justice because of our God and because of His Lamb. Hear us for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to our speakers this evening, and thank you to each one of you for joining us online. Uh, please remember that you may submit questions for our panel discussion tomorrow at 12.30 Pacific time. You can submit those questions by email at conference at westcal.edu or by Twitter at hashtag WSCCONF. The first morning session will begin tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time with Dr. David Van Drunen. Uh, until then, God bless you and good night.